Hello, good afternoon. My name is Axel Wieder. I'm director of Bergen Kunsthall, and I have uh, the pleasure to invite uh, to an afternoon uh, of a conversation and uh, a film screening that is both focusi focusing on uh, the exhibition Jill Johnston, The Disintegration of a Critic, which we opened uh, 10 days ago uh, downstairs in gallery number five. This exhibition deals with the work uh, and legacy uh, of the writer, critic, uh, lesbian icon, uh, Jill Johnston. And uh, it's, a com it's an exhibition that uh, is based on text, which is uh, a difficult premise for an exhibition. So this is also one point that we thought uh, would be interesting to discuss today, besides other obvious aspects, such as the work by Jill Johnston herself, and. Um, the curatorial rationale behind the exhibition, and so on. Um, yeah. This exhibition uh, was done uh, in collaboration with uh, two curators, both artist curators, both based in Berlin. Uh, Megan Francis Sullivan, artist based in Berlin, initially from uh, America, and Fiona McGovern, um, art historian, and now a junior professor in Hildesheim in Germany. And we're joined tonight, today by uh, Christian Wistrup Madsen, uh, a critic and writer initially from Denmark, but also based in Berlin, um, who has worked in the past uh, occasionally also on questions of criticism, the role of criticism, and um, who's also, besides that, uh, an, an uh, a Jill Johnston enthusiast. <laughs> if that's... <laughs> Possible to say, but we thought it was would be interesting to to have him here with us today, um, to have also um, another perspective uh, in between ours, which uh, who have worked now on this uh, exhibition for a while. Um, yeah, just for to uh, the afternoon now, uh, we thought we have maybe a 40, 45 minute conversation, and then open up to. Uh, question from all of you, and um, then afterwards at uh, three o'clock, uh, we're screening a film also here in this space, um, uh, a documentary um, from 1979 uh, about a 1971 uh, panel conference, um, Town Bloody Hall by uh, Chris uh, Hegedus and D.A. Pennebaker. Uh, in which Jill Johnston has a legendary uh, appearance and which is otherwise also uh, a kind of crucial document of uh, feminist debates uh, of the time and uh, feminist p politics and also gives an, a, a good insight into the climate within these debates at the time. Um, maybe I also announce briefly that we have, this is uh, the first event uh, that happens in relation to the exhibition. We have another event next Wednesday, a talk by Chris Krauss happening at 8 o'clock, and then next Saturday, uh, 2 o'clock, uh, a workshop with um, artist, filmmaker, and activist Peter Bauer from Stockholm, which is, uh, the workshop will be based on uh, workshops that uh, um, Jill Johnson has run in the 1970s. Uh, it requires uh, registration, um, I think, on this information on our website and Facebook page, and Maria is very... Uh, helpful in uh, finding out more about this. We will be monitoring the time of workshops. Yeah. And then I wanted to also mention that's a uh, more disclaimer that uh, this event is live streamed, so uh, make sure there are two cameras. Uh, if you don't want to appear in uh, the picture, please uh, sit, sit, sit somewhere uh, outside of the camera angle. Make sure that you're not captured. <laughs> Good. That's it. <laughs> As a disclaimer. Then uh, let's start um, <laughs> with the exhibition. We thought it's maybe good to also uh, show uh, a couple of um, images that relate to uh, the show. So um, one starting point for us uh, talking about Jill Johnston was uh, her column that she ran for 15 years uh, in the New York-based uh, newspaper weekly, uh, The Village Voice. Um, um, her own column, which is uh, produced all over these years, and uh, which initially covered mainly dance. Uh, here's an example from um, a Merce Cunningham piece, and uh, especially, uh, especially uh, activities around Judson dance uh, 
theater. Uh, she's, uh, that's one important thing why she's um, still super relevant today, the kind of spokesperson uh, testimonial of um, uh, these uh, activities. Um, and uh, yeah, that's uh, a picture from uh, downstairs, a piece actually uh, by Megan, uh, an appropriation of an advertisement uh, that has this uh, very nice quote. It is quite possible that Jill Johnston is one of the most important, radical, and innovative writers of her time. And that points to the fact that, uh, so even though uh, she's very important about what she has written about, it's also <coughs> super important uh, what she did with her writing, that her writing in itself was a cultural practice mm -hmm. that was in uh, extremely uh, closely linked to what she was writing about. It was in herself um, an experimental practice that tried to deal with uh, questions of like objectivity um, and uh, how to participate as a kind of viewer, as a writer in pieces that you write about, how to be part of a scene. And then there's another um, super important um, aspect, which is her activist or uh, radical lesbian feminist work. Um, this is a, a seminal book, Lesbian Nation, uh, The Feminist Solution, uh, which played an important role in uh, feminist debates of the time and uh, marks kind of, uh, it's a kind of uh, the most, one of the most outspoken and public uh, moments um, of this work by herself, like being a, a very present and openly lesbian uh, writer and cultural producer that also thematized um, lesbianism in her work. Yeah, in the book that we published that uh, accompanies the show, uh, we uh, focused really on uh, the columns. So the book contains 30 columns that uh, cover almost the whole period of um, her writing uh, uh, for the Village Voice. Uh, so it spans from uh, the early dance criticism to the kind of longer free form associative uh, quasi uh, uh, fly, um, flow of consciousness. Um, lesbian rants, you said earlier. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> um, and then um, maybe just one other aspect, which is uh, that she was present as a writer, but also very much as a persona, as uh, uh, a person who was very conscious also about her stage, the staging of herself as a persona. So she was uh, visible uh, in photographs, in live actions. She participated in performances that she wrote about. And that was in part uh, because she wanted to, to dissolve this kind of boundary between uh, the object that's written about and the objective critic. Uh, but then also because, um, or at least that's our take or our interpretation, it was really also about fabricating um, this person uh, uh, almost as an artifact, as a, as a performative um, action, staging herself um, within a cultural context and not being the invisible uh, uh, distant, um, neutral um, voice. So this is from um, a film by Andy Warhol showing herself and um, Freddie Herko, uh, yeah, I guess you can say improvising um, in front of his camera and um, also a film that we have uh, downstairs in the exhibition. That as a kind of uh, quick wrap up of uh, <laughs> content and ambition. And uh, yeah, we have uh, a couple of more images, but we thought it's interesting also to hand over actually to, to Christian to, to start a conversation, guide us through um, the discussion. Right. Yeah. Um, and add his own thoughts. Yeah, I yeah. think um, what's really, like this show is called The Disintegration of the Critic, uh, which is a, um, this is also the title of the book. This is a seminar that Jill Johnston held in, or a panel discussion that she held in, 69, um, and, and, I, and I think that it kind of marks this, or not, or even before then, I think 1965 with the piece that she wrote in the Village Voice called Critics Critic, is a kind of like a moment when her practice, when, when, when that column sort of changes and it, and it stops being about um, uh, like a single dance performance or like kind of it departs from, from the sort of, from like normal art criticism in a way. And she really starts thinking, she becomes fed up with criticism in a sense, and she sort of starts um, disintegrating, let's say, and like, and I think that it's interesting to think about what that means. Um, she writes in that piece, um, if, crit if critics can admit the call and response nature of art, can allow for the fact that meeting, meaning is made between a maker, her work, and her audience, then why can't artists do the same? 
I also stake out a claim to be an artist, a writer, if that's what I'm doing when I get to, when I get to the typewriter and decide that I like something well enough to say that what, what I think it's all about. Um, that there's, she becomes fed up with kind of being called a, a parasite or the, this kind of idea of the critic as a parasite who doesn't really add, who, who just sort of feeds on, on the artwork in a certain sense. Um, and I think that's kind of, it's super interesting what happens here when we've got like a curator and an art historian and an artist. There is this kind of disintegration of, of like a certain, like you're, you're kind of working all together across disciplines um, to make this show about a critic. Um, this is something I've never seen before. Um, like, cause there's lots of shows now about curators and I wonder how, kind of how, like, um, what that does to her, like how, how do you present a critic's practice in an art exhibition, Axie? Sure. Let's dance. You could, I mean, <laughs> it's, your, it's your, yeah. As, as someone who, like as the curator, who, who, as, the, as the front man of this institution. Um, that, that's a big question. I mean, the one, of course there's an institutional uh, interest, like uh, with, uh, especially with this room number five that we have, um, which is the smallest uh, space uh, or the smaller space in relation to the bigger uh, galleries, um, it's, um, it can function as this space for research and reflection and maybe uh, a critic's practice is actually really a good um, starting point to think about a, uh, a social function, like a, a moment when, um, an artistic, when artistic practices not just become things on the wall or things to... Um, uh, perceive aesthetically, but it's really about discourse on the forefront. So that's that's one point of interest for me. And then uh, Jill Johnston also, uh, as a person with, who was very conscious about this role of writing, initiating, uh, being in the center of, of discourse, staging that almost, uh, uh, yeah, stage-like, um, by being this uh, very visible and often controversial, uh, conflicting fi um, figure. Mm. I think it's worth oh sorry, yeah. it, to jump in and just also mention that her writing was very hard to um, reach. So uh, Marmalade Me, which was a collection already of uh, columns of her, was printed in, what, 71 or 72, something like this? Uh, 71. And when was the second edition? In the 90s. As in well, the so 90s. So 90s. Basically, like her work, her column writing, her criticism has been out of print since the 90s. And uh, even to, you know, read the, the work, you'd have to, you know, there's very few instances um, to approach it. So aside from an exhibition standpoint, I think a lot of our motivation was just to access these texts again and, and get back into them. And how did you, how did you kind of uh, come upon her to begin with? I think each of us is a bit different. Uh, I mean, Axel and I both share a friendship with Nick Maus and Ken Okishi, who are two artists. And, um, you know, there's people in New York uh, who've been fans of hers for a long time and sort of mm. keep this legend going, even though her work is out of print. And so I had the kind of personal uh, layer to that introduction to access these texts and just you know, where you can find them. A few were reprinted here and there, but um, so just to, to get to them was my uh, personal uh, connection, but I think Fiona, you also had a different one. <laughs> yeah, I shared an office with an artist, uh, with a dance historian, dance scholar, who, uh, yeah, whose research focuses on the Judson Dance Theater, and I think through that context and her colleagues, I learned about her as a like spokesperson, as you said, for the Judson dance, even mm -hmm. Rayna and so on. She was one of the first people to write about that and participating as well. Mm -hmm. And then only later I found out about that whole lesbian activism and yeah, the lesbian nation and so on. And yeah, I was really struck that people either knew her as that dance critic or as a lesbian, like radical lesbian, um, very outspoken person and p public figure. Um, and then, I mean, I personally, I'm very much interested in, in artists or culture figures who, yeah, don't care so much about disciplinary restrictions or mm -hmm. categories or whatever. And then um, I think it was an article by Munoz um, from Cruising Utopia where he, he coined this term of radical interdisciplinarity and bringing interdisciplinarity or intermedia 
together with like a yeah queer practice, mm -hmm. and that really hooked me kind yeah, of. Because yeah. <laughs> it's kind of an, a, yeah. it's, it's an amazing document art historically, and so far as there's as you say, there's hardly any dance criticism, and Jill Johnson is very vocal in her criticism of of the kind of lack of dance publications at the time. So so in that sense, her her kind of weighing in on on the on dance as a form of contemporary art at the time is super um, is super valuable. But then, as you say, it's interesting that this schism kind of occurred, that there are the people who know about the dance criticism, and then there are the people who know about her as a, as a quote unquote radical lesbian, mm. which is what she, she coined herself. Mm. It's just a funny anecdote. I mean, the book Lesbian Nation, the only other language it was translated to is German, and she really had a really, like, she had a big impact on the lesbian separatist mm. scene, maybe even caused that. Um, and for them, it was when I spoke to people there, and the, there's a lesbian archive called Spinboden, they were totally surprised that she wasn't like this big icon for everyone, and that it was the only language it was translated to. Uh -huh. So, very different images of her. Yeah. What I think is wonderful about this book and about the exhibition also is that it really shows um, how um, Jill, like Jill Johnson's practice or her body of work is really one body. Um, and that like there's this kind of, um, there's this, she arrives really late at this seminar that she organized called Dis The Disintegration of the Critic. And she, and she sort of is, is livid when she arrives because her column has been canceled in the Village Voice. It hadn't actually been canceled, it had been given a different name. But she, she sort of shouts like, it's all one thing, they don't understand, it's all one thing. That like that there was this like the, the continuity week by week of what she wrote kind of belonged to sort of a, a stream like an ongoing thought and that was whether she was she was kind of literally reviewing a dance show like she did in the early 60s or having a kind of like an, an unpunctuated rant about um, her problems with with hetero feminism or uh, or, or whatever else she might have done on the weekend or something. It kind of, it's really all one thing and we see this really well in the book, but I also think the exhibition format lends itself well to showing this. Well, that was also, um, I think, why we decided upon to select columns from the Village Voice because this column was actually like the platform where this uh, development into writing could take place. Because, I mean, obviously she wrote other things, not only for the Village Voice, but for Dance Observer or, you know, art criticism and stuff like this. But as a location, uh, these Village Voice columns was actually in that format, uh, yeah, where this sort of whole transformation and um, continuous mm. writing practice could develop in a way. I first came into, uh, I first read Jill Johnson act actually through um, Megan and, and the publication that you made in 2008, 17, 18, um, for, um, that was a, a reprint of this essay called A Nice, Well-Behaved, Fucked Up Person, right? Um, which is one of the essays from Lesbian Nation um, that describes what Jill calls her coming to her lesbian senses. Um, Quite a different way in from from yours <laughs> with with the with kind of the what the work that she did about the Judson Dance Company is that how you got into Jill Johnston? Actually, not. It was um, I think through a fair to meddling story that was the essay that uh, Nick and Ken put in their catalog for uh, Künstlerhaus Stuttgart, and then somehow they continued to mention. And uh, Nick Mal sent me then this amazing. Uh, column that she wrote, I didn't even know at the time it was a column about Agnes Martin, where she visits Agnes Martin in the desert, and uh, I think that becomes like a really influential way about talking about uh, art, but also like on a personal level, I mean, for later writers, because she goes and visits Agnes Martin in the desert, and you know, there's so many things entwined in the anecdote of it, and, and what comes out of that. Then only later, a friend of mine, uh, Sabina Reitmeier, had Lesbian Nation on her shelf, which I then started carrying around in the train and reading that. And it's just such, like, it's literature. It's not, you know, it's, it has its own uh, life to it. It's really not only about the position um, related to gender at all. It's really like literature. Uh, yeah, so um, very different aspects. <laughs> Um, her, I think Jill Johnson's writing, because you'd really have to have to read it, because it's something um, like 
by the end of the column, she's kind of like her column would begin with an ellipsis and then an and. And it, it just like it literally began where the, where the previous column kind of s stopped. There's this sort of extreme flow to it. And a lot of people who've described her work since has described it as a kind of um, as a kind of cleansing or like a spring cleaning. A lot of people like think that there's something very refreshing about it because it is this kind of like wave of just like, it's not even really content. It's, it's just like mess. It's <laughs> uncertainty and like spontaneity. Um, and I guess um, that's something that, that was kind of missing and maybe in art criticism at the time. Mm. Um, how do, how do you think that that changed with Johnston? Because she wasn't, she was, she was very influential. Uh, like also other people started writing like her or she was influenced by other people. It was kind of a movement that was happening at the time. Yeah, I mean, she clearly was, one person always referred to as Gertrude Stein. She also wrote about her and then Lil Pika links her to James Joyce. Uh, she's Lil Pika herself and Gregory Blackcock, who has a text in the book as well, um, and the appendix. They clearly were influenced by her writing, mm. um, and they say it openly, or Perrault also mentioned it, Jean Perrault, another critic of that time. Um, but I wouldn't say it's just a mess. <laughs> I mean, she still has something to say, but Absolutely. I also, uh, I mean, we used the word platform in our introduction for the column. Um, because, yeah, I also think it has several functions and it changes, even though I would agree that I wouldn't say in the beginning there was objective criticism and then there's like stream of consciousness rant also. Um, because even in the beginning, she frames what she's seeing by describing um, how, how she got there or the atmosphere, the audience. Um, so it's more than just a uh, yeah, straightforward analysis and of the dance piece or so on. And you mentioned already like one good example is Inside Originale, um, the piece by, that uh, Charlotte Mormon brought to her New York avant-garde festival at the Stockhausen, or Mary Bauermeister, and Bauermeister and Stockhausen piece that she also performed in. And it's called Inside Originale. So she's writing it from an inside perspective as a critic looking at it. And that really brings those, and that's also from the, that's from 64 or so. I mean, there's, 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 there's this aspect of um, th that, uh, let's call it emancipatory politics, and artistic practices or aesthetic practices are so closely interlinked, mm. and which is really something that's maybe a bit missing today, that uh, there is a, a sense of like uh, the connectedness and that um, uh, art wants really something from or to the world. And, um, and that, that relates to the world, but also to ourselves and how we um, express something through what we do. Yeah. That is so clearly and inseparably linked to yeah. us. And um, so there was um, one moment we also looked at um, Avalanche magazine, for example, uh, because there's an advertising for um, Marmalade Me, the book, in one of the copies of uh, Avalanche magazine. And then just by that, by in looking again at uh, the context of also John, uh, Johnston's own um, printed material. Uh, so she obviously she's a, a special figure and an amazing writer, an outstanding writer, but she's also part of a context and that's uh, very well reflected. And um, in a way uh, we thought about, uh, Megan, you said like um, Avalanche was so much um, a propag propaganda for um, a certain take on aesthetics and politics of the time. And it's so missing today. Like, um, if, you, if, if, if one thinks about um, how art institutions communicate, I guess, or how artists communicate, how artists try to frame their practice, and uh, the kind of, yeah, I mean, to say it in cliches, but the typical PDF format of um, five lines, how artists describe their work, it's um, so depressing in a way in relation to um, uh, this kind of whole. Um, aesthetic political continuum that kind of uh, flows over magazines like Avalanche or the writing of Jill Johnston. Mm. Yeah. She just didn't care about any kind of boundaries and then, yeah, in regards to her own life and her readership, but also theory and practice. And, um, and she has an untitled a column we also have in the book. She um, comes up with her own uh, 
um, definition of intermediate where she says it's like before and after people chop it up into pieces and put it in filing cabinets called, um, titled mine, yours, and theirs. And that's, I think it's also pretty much what she's doing. Like. Mm -hmm. And that's also one reason why I think she's no one, or it took so long to that people now write about her. I mean, there are a few scholars working on her and their books coming out sooner or later. Um, but it's that also, it's so, there are so many different ways you could access her. And at the same sh time, she falls like out of any kind of academic raster, if you can, or like, it's not so easy to put her in one box mm -hmm. so, because yeah. you actually you should look at the whole thing. <laughs> and it's also like the way that the, the, p the place of uh, subjectivity in, in her writing is really kind of interesting because it is, a, she's so much in her writing and that's like maybe the first thing that people would say about, about her that she puts herself in there. But then it's, it's, it's there's a kind of like, um, but then she disintegrates that subject position almost by exacerbating her own presence in her texts. That like that she becomes there are no boundaries as you say like her there are no boundaries between her and the work and between the other people around her, so it becomes so it, there's a kind of like um, she like she like um, it, like identity kind of implodes in a way, um, which I think is what makes her work so useful to also also in this kind of context of emancipatory politics because it doesn't create a new paradigm it's like it's like always this kind of radical like instability um, that is really productive. I think instability is an interesting word to pick up to talk about the exhibition. Because um, we, yeah, I mean, oh, uh, I think the exhibition has a bit of an unstable uh, structure that uh, I would propose to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean? Um, I mean, you have these different threads. What was it? Six different kind of. Yeah, it's like I mean, we called it sections, but it's not. Again, it's not clearly defined. Um, it's more an orientation to yeah. Dive into her, the material, and into her as a person and cultural producer and writer. Um, but we start yeah. How do we start? Uh, with the dance criticism. <laughs> the next one is Culture Hero, which mainly links back to a magazine. Um, Les Levine, another artist um, she was friends with, also published in 70, 70 71. It was dedicated to her, and sh um, with the help, or she actually asked her friends and acquaintances at that time to contribute one page about her. Um, then the next one is, uh, no, I have to look up, uh, yeah, this disintegration of a critic, so that's dedicated to the panel we already mentioned, um, and that's, as we said, the whole appendix of this book is dedicated to that um, panel as well, so we have the advertisement for it, her own press release, which is really interesting to read, and then also the uh, yeah, Andy Warhol did a recording of the panel, and a transcript of that is in The Culture Hero, uh, and in our book, and then there are two reviews of the show, one by, uh, of the panel, one by Jean Perrault, and then one by Gregory Backcock, who also ran his own column called The Last Estate in the New York Review of Sex. Um, and then the next chapter is, oh, you wanna continue? <laughs> <laughs> um, of this pure but uh, regular passion, which is the title of her, uh, yeah, if you want so coming out column um, in 1970. Um, other people refer to Louise Lane as a lesbian shortly later, but I think in Lesbian Nation, I just looked it up again, she also refers to this column actually. Uh, and from then on, she yeah, very openly writes about lesbian issues, the struggle within the feminist movement, um, her activities. She's attending lots of panels and traveling around the country. And then we have one section on lesbian nation and community building. Uh, this is a slideshow you, or slides you found. Uh, it's the Phyllis, no. Phyllis Berkby yeah. archive at Smith College. And the last section is dedicated uh, to the flux wedding um, it's 1993, she married her longtime partner, Ingrid Nübel, 
Um, and this whole uh, event was turned into a flux wedding by Jeffrey Hendricks, um, a fluxus artist who in the early 70s had his own well, kind of symbolically divorced from his wife in the flux divorce and both him and his wife then lived openly as gay and lesbians. So it's kind of mirroring that early fluxus event. Yeah, those are the sections. Yeah, and then so uh, it's also like the type of things that are shown. They're sometimes directly related to Jill Johnston, but some of them are just related to columns. Like we have this great work by Sturdevant in the show, because uh, Jill Johnston wrote the column Cancelled about uh, Sturdevant's piece Relash. And uh, yeah, so, you know, then there's obviously other things like. Uh, biographically connected to her, but I think it was really interesting to put these different types of material and information together within an exhibition, because then we were like, oh, is it an art exhibition? Because we have artworks in there, like by Stodavant or Andy Warhol or Les Levine, but then there's also like archival materials or personal artifacts and things like that. So there's a structure. This is also something that um, Gregory Badcock writes about, um, Jill Johnston, that she kind of exists. He talks about anti-art, right? And, and, and anti, anti-work, like all these different types of sort of antis, where like, an, like Andy Warhol supposedly makes um, anti-art. And, and you have someone like John Cage's silent symphonies as, as a kind of anti-music maybe. And, and to think about what anti-criticism or anti-writing might be and that, that and, and, um, Gregory um, Badcock says that Jill Johnston is the only one that's kind of doing that, and and Gene Swenson he mentions as well. Um, and there's something, um, yeah, I guess can what, what how can we characterize this uh, anti criticism? I think you said something interesting downstairs <laughs> because there's this Lewis Horst piece that Jill Johnston refers to, uh, I think in Critics Critic or something like this. Anyways, it was a, a piece that Lewis Horst did in Dance Observer, uh, where he saw uh, work by Paul Taylor and company. And instead of writing about it, it was a kind of a middle minimalist work, he left it empty. So there's a title, a blank space, and then his initials. And you mentioned how this is emptiness, but that Jill Johnson is really more like filling up, but it's still kind of empty. and. Uh, I mean, not empty in a negative sense, mm. but you know, it's uh, what is this type of feeling that she provides? I mean, yeah, the columns yeah. get longer and longer, and uh, all of these activities. So, uh, is there an anti also in the feeling in this, like, mm. uh, you know? I have this quote right here. Actually, it's really uh, kind of a good example of her of her writing. Um, it's it's all one sentence. <laughs> And it goes, I think one of the finest pieces of dance criticism, or any criticism for that matter, was a column written by Lewis Horst, the grand old man of the modern dance, two or three years before he died in 1957 or eight or whenever it was that Paul Taylor presented that extraordinary concert in which nothing very significant happened, except that it was a concert by Paul Taylor and he stood still a lot or changed positions, I'm not sure which, it doesn't matter. And I remember two girls in dresses and heels who stood still most of the time too. And anyway, Lewis Horst presented his version of that concert a blank column in the now defunct dance observer um, and 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 what I what I sort of like about this is I mean working as an art critic it's like it's all about fact checking and it's all about like you couldn't be like oh was it in 1957 or 58 and I'm not I'm not really sure whether they stood still or whether they were moving it's like but but it's not this is actually more accurate it's not about like it's not like a it's about kind of representing your your feelings towards this original piece, and she kind of does that by by like profusion, and like so it's like a similarly sort of abstract effect that her writing has as this like blank space um, of of the other review, because that that is how to like how do you render your experience, you know, how do you turn your experience into writing, and sometimes you feel like you can't, and other times you feel like you have to write something that is like erratic in order to kind of represent yourself. People became addicted to her writing. I mean, uh, especially in the 70s, she really became, yeah, you mentioned said lesbian icon in the beginning, and she would be, really became an important figure because <laughs> at that time there was no like lesbian identity people could refer to. So this column actually helped to create that and her stream of consciousness like 
style to yeah talk about anything that she experienced um, if it was political activism or her sex life. I think another thing that I really that I found very expiring, I guess we can we can maybe talk not expiring, inspiring, <laughs> um, talk about um, that, that she has this energy, her and Gene Swenson too, but Gene Swenson in a different way, but he's, he's this other critic at the time who is, who is this kind of gay activist and who really, like, he, he totally kind of blew himself up. But um, in a parentheses in, one, in, in the column called Bash the Skulls, Gene, um, Jill writes, Gene, before he died, said he was returning the earth to the land as he threw his flower pots from fifth story to sidewalk. Like, I feel like there's something kind of, it's almost like Dada or something, just like throwing all your flower pots down from your balcony. Mm -hmm. And it feels like there's something, there's a certain kind of like energy there, like just like not making any sense, just, but just responding. Like they're so frustrated with how, the thing, how things are. And then they respond in this way. It's really opposite to today where everyone is really cautious and really like trying to make sense of everything. Um, also, there's editing today. I mean, Village Voice basically didn't do any editing. Later, when the columns got longer, they like cut the columns in two, or yeah, I think two maximum. And that, I mean, it's really interesting actually to look at the original copies because um, in the beginning it was one page, and then later it was started in the beginning of the magazine, and then you had another piece in the middle and another in the end. And then later, like the Agnes Martin one that you mentioned, that appeared in two different editions of the magazine because it got so long. Um, mm. So that's yeah. totally unimaginable today mm. because the editing, I mean, it's so formalized and standardized also of what an art review, for example, should be like or a dance review. Yeah. I don't think. And also what wouldn't happen is this, like, um, just like having somebody writing every week for a publication for so many years, this is really, and, and at a time when really it, the art world was also much more local. So, um, there, yeah, it's, it's such a different context you almost can't compare. Um, it's also so gaga because the language is like on fire. Like if you read it now, it just like burns. Mm. <laughs> so I don't know, just as a carrier of, of time or, you know, of, of what writing can do. I mean, I don't know of anything comparable. I mean, I like somebody um, said at the on, there's, on the transcription from the panel. Somebody asked, "Does Miss Does Miss Miss Johnston live her column, or is or has it become a substitute for her life?" Um, that there is this kind of thing that her write her writing was was her life, and she she like this 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 amazing scene when when there's Gloria. Um, Steinem is doing, they're doing some kind of feminist fundraising at some fancy house in the Hamptons, and, and Jill just takes her clothes off. Uh, and Betty Friedan. Oh. It was Betty Friedan. All right. <laughs> um, she goes in the pool anyway, and swims naked in the pool, and people are asking, like she basically disrupts this fu fundraiser, and people are asking her, why did you do it? Why did you do it? And she just, she said, um, she was hot and drunk. <laughs> and then she said, I think one should be serious in one's purposes, but not necessarily solemn. And that's like what she was, you know, she was always serious, but she just was not necessarily solemn. But she connects that, actually it's interesting because she connects that to Duchamp, uh, like she, she quotes him uh, in another column where he said something similar. So oftentimes if you read the book also there's these strange uh, things that come out again or like these overlaps that we didn't necessarily intend but they like emerge through it uh, in this kind of ghosty way. And I, I realized that also came from a Duchamp uh, uh -huh. reference that she made in another column. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of, yeah, things are popping out we didn't even plan. Or so. Yeah. yeah. It's not in this case, it's like the action speaks for itself because a lot of people said, oh, yeah, that's, this was your statement on Betty Friedman's like anti lesbian politics. And I think that, no, and with that sentence, it's like. Yeah. It became that anyway, but she, she... Yeah, and she complained no one actually wrote about her good swimming style. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, how are we for time? Yeah, how's the time? A couple more minutes. Mm. <laughs> um, well, I mean, you can also open it up. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, I think we can also, like, because I was thinking about how she's kind of influenced art criticism, maybe, or, like, well, how, because there was a kind of big change in art criticism at that time that isn't only about, um, that isn't only about Jill Johnston, but kind of, like, art forums, um, editor F uh, Philip Leiter from that period, because when I read the piece about um, Agnes Martin in the, in the desert, there's a really kind of, um, there's this big piece by Philip Leiter called How I Spent My Summer Vacation that came out in Art Forum in, in 1970, which is also this like big moment for art criticism when you hear about the editor's summer holiday. <laughs> and this was, and of course he was like on summer holiday with Richard Serra, so, so it was relevant. But, um, but, but there are other people who are kind of working in this style, and I think the style has more or less in some contexts become ubiquitous, and in other ones very much not. Um, and I think we're still, I don't know, as a critic, like still struggling with these, like that in some formats, it's very easy to write like <laughs> something free and funny. And then, but then you're like, it's very much this, this criticism that Jill made of the, in the, in the column called Critics Critics, where she says the critic is basically a, an unpaid PR agent. Like this, somebody actually wrote this in Harper's Magazine last month. Like that this is very much still where the debate is. Um, I guess that also speaks to like the relevance of like this work and the exhibition. Um. Her way out was autobiographical writing, biographical autobiographical writing. Mm -hmm. She published five books, I think. Like the la latest was in 2010 or 11, uh, 10 obviously. She died 2010, yeah. yeah. Another way out that I think that Jill also kind of takes is fiction. It's like it's autobi it's like the, the the it's like autobiography, but it's also totally like um, this way that it doesn't she doesn't really care about truth necessarily, or she doesn't care about the boundaries of her own subjectivity. And um, Bruce Hanley, who writes um, one of the responses to Jill Johnston in this in this book, um, in a different text, I think he really nails this. This is from the 1990s. Um, I want it, I found this quote. Um, he says in 1999, he's writing in Freeze, I think it's time to date rate art criticism, art history. Too often art critics and art historians ignore the fictive element of their enterprise. Instead of continuing to write impoverished little treatises which frequently obscure rather than clarify what might be seen, why not embrace the possibility that what is being written are fictions and that the works or whatever that get the most interesting stories written about them that can sustain wildly differing um, stories are the things that which seem for a time to be the most relevant. Um, I think this is kind of what, like this idea of writing fictions and like telling good stories and, and this like total that like when Jill was part of a performance that was like creating a story but when she like jumped in the swimming pool that was also like like another thing she said when she did that was, um, I have to, I have to do things. I have to make my life interesting, so I have something to write about in my column. I mean, uh, it's a kind of happy coincidence and a nice thing that Chris Krause is going to be speaking in relation to the show or something like this, because obviously, you know, reading I Love Dick or something like this, it's like, um, yeah, there's a lot of autobiography weaved in, but there's also like a art history telling weaved in and um, yeah, these kind of uh, layers that get accessed and uh, so I think in, in that trajectory you can see, but there's also nice because when I was reading uh, Jill Johnston, I happened to be reading uh, a book by Violette Le Duc, La Badhar, who was a French writer, um, and I mean, it's a, it's a novel, obviously, but it's also very autobiographical. And then at a certain point, Jill Johnson also mentions uh, Violette Le Duc in Le Batard in, in her book. So also, if you see this type of writing as a lineage, or like a lineage of bastards in a way, because I mean, Jill Johnson was a bastard, so to say, because she never knew her father, and it's something that she continued uh, to pursue later in mm -hmm. life, but uh, I don't know, just like a lineage of, of not having a lineage, so to yeah. say, and that's something really exciting, I think. I think another way of saying that, or like picking up on this thing, idea of the bastard, is, is that she, she, um, she talks about playing the fool a lot. Mm -hmm. 
and and like and as you say, it's like there are actually all these literary references in her texts, like hidden references to Duchamp or whatever. Like there's nothing kind of stupid about what she's saying, but she's often playing the fool, like getting dates wrong or something. I'm wondering, like I don't know, what do you think she gets out of that? Um, I mean, it's quite plain when you read it, in a way, what she gets out of it, but it's also interesting to think about. Mm -hmm. It's like a lack of authority. She, like, secedes authority. Um. Yeah, I wouldn't overemphasize her playing the fool, but, it, I mean, one thing that comes up is that she likes hanging from the pipes uh, at parties. Um, that's one thing she did mm -hmm. regularly. But I um, actually, I wanted to say something else, be, uh, that it's, you can, that relates back to history, uh, and that you you can access different histories through her writing also. <laughs> For example, she stops writing about Judson Dance Theater at a time when that was kind of over anyway. And then the disintegration panel, 69, end of May, is one month before Stonewall happened. So it's actually also interesting to relate that to what was happening in yeah that community of artists, New York avant-garde of that time, but also in a larger, like, scale um, when you look to society and politics in general and then it doesn't it isn't really a, like um, literal disintegration maybe but a, like moving with time also yeah um. yes. so maybe it's time to ask if uh, anybody has a question or comment which we would very much welcome yes <laughs> Um, how do you think that um, she would have reviewed the show downstairs? <laughs> she would crash the opening. Yeah. yeah, she would probably talk about how um, how she got here and she had a like too expensive hot dog at the airport and it was raining and uh, yeah, you know, she like jumped in the lake naked. <laughs> <laughs> We, we, we didn't, I mean, that's maybe a short to say, we didn't try to emulate an exhibition style of her writing. If then maybe the, the clustering, but not uh, stylistically or so. Yeah, I mean, it's, of course, there's a lot of text in the show, and, and that sounds way too academic for someone like Jill Johnson, but I, I mean, at least me personally, I hope that you can find different ways of access just through the artwork, the images, and I mean, it's it's a lot of, I hope, visually engaging material in there, so that it's, I mean, you don't have to read every piece of but paper, also, like, every if you text. Do, <laughs> there is text, but text is like weirdly stigmatized in, mm. I mean, obviously art exhibitions tend to be visual, but if you read the text, it's not like, it says like, blah, 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 Foucault. It says <laughs> like, you know, <laughs> like, fuck the system, and like, I, like, I, took my tits out or something. You know, it's like a really, the, the texts are kind of amazing. Like I'd re like it, read that one on, on the canceled show uh, the, with the Stuyvesant. Like, I don't know, they're just, they're quite short and they're really funny. Um, Thank you very much. This is, it's so interesting, so exciting. And I was wondering about um, what you were saying about her transgressing this line bef between being an observer and uh, performer, that she was often taking part in the performances that she was writing about. So I was wondering, was she actually a professional dancer too? Or was she just uh, improvisingly crushing the performances? Or, yeah, and, and if she was a professional dancer, if that was an important part if it was important for her writing and the way she was observing the and writing about these performances? She definitely had some training, but I think she never really danced as a professional dancer, as, as far as I know. But she was very much involved, like, part of that scene at the time, and she there's one poster downstairs by a, by a dance, or like a dance concert she organized, and uh, she participated in a cage performance, but it was... Yeah, I, I don't think I read anywhere that she really 
I think I consider. remember reading that she did train as a dancer, yeah. also with Jose Limon or whatever, and then broke her foot at a certain point. And, uh, but she knew very much a lot about dancing, I think, then also from that perspective. But also that's interesting to think about now because, uh, I mean, to be such a, um, yeah, to know so much and be able to speak about it so much, but also simply from experience on different levels. I mean, I don't think she got a master degree in dance or something like that. Or even, or even art history. Yeah. When she was <laughs> offered the, to, to, where was she? She was offered like a column in an art paper as well and she kind of, she also wrote that like she took it with no like no prior knowledge really, yeah. <laughs> um, so there was. But that was also this kind of like will, willful like unskilledness or something. Where it's like actually she did know quite a lot, but she would say that she came with nothing. I mean, she's quoting so many books and other people in her column. It's uh, mm -hmm. she definitely was aware of what was around, even though she wasn't like an academic in that sense or academically trained or professionally professional dancer. But she also called, in a way, for a dance, uh, a dance discourse. There's some column where she's saying, like, oh, you know, there's so much painting discourse, and painting is so mm -hmm. important because there's, like, this huge history of painting discourse, and ar even artists write about painting and all of this, and she calls for, like, you know, dancers to do the same. And I think she was trying to establish a dance discourse on par with painting also, I mean. I just wanted to ask about this sense of uh, maybe nostalgia or melancholia that kind of I think uh, comes across quite a lot. And how would you? In our attitudes. Or? Yeah, and the way you talk about the past and how is that? I think maybe also portrayed in the show and so with the artifacts and everything and and also when we talked about solemnity in relation to all this work, how is that uh, plays with this? Yeah. It's hard not to become a fan of her <laughs> when you deal with all this material. Um, nostalgia. Hmm. I don't. Uh, what do you think, Axel? <laughs> I, I lost my microphone. Um, I mean, um, certainly one. I mean, we, we did a show which is trying to obviously actualize the work again, like a, I don't know, silly word, but it, it tries to do something with um, the text today and some of the events are also part of that, I would say that um, it's not let, letting it rest in nostalgia and the book, I guess, maybe plays with certain a certain readability, but it's done um, by contemporary designers. I mean, it, so it, certainly the, the whole project tries to get something out of it for today. Mm. Um, I'm, so I'm not sure I mean, I think for me, the this, least, yeah. in, well, I mean, because I was, I've not been part of the exhibition project, but for me, the least interesting aspect is, is the, is the nostalgia or this kind of like yeah. fetishization of like the downtown scene in the seventies. It's like, oh, that's really annoying and tiring, I find in a way. But like what I like about um, just kind of r discovering this work, because um, for me, it's not a rediscovery. I'm like, I'm just, I'm just reading it now. And like literally last week, I like, met a different critic who was like in Berlin, like an art critic who was just like drunk at a bar and just like moaning about what she thinks is the problem with art criticism. And she was naming exactly the same things that Jill Johnston was naming. And we were talking about how we like, we really want to write a type of criticism that is more immediate and more where you can be wrong about things and you can just like offer your ideas on a more, you know, because we're both subject to these kinds of editorial constraints that you, that you work under at, in the magazines. Like for me, that's not really an, it's not really a nostalgic concern, it was just really like, she, it was just quite inspiring. Hmm. Just to add one thing, that even if you think you know all this about, like everything about fluxes and downtown New York at the sink sticks, I think reading her columns again, offers you a totally different perspective on it mm. because it's, yeah, it's, n this work hasn't been published so much and people know, I mean, yeah, there's a lot available, but not this particular perspective mm. maybe. So I think even that is not 
just repeating the same thing, I would say. So maybe a question for you, Christian, or, or maybe the whole panel, but are there any forums or magazines today that will kind of allow this kind of practice and this kind of writing today that you could point to? Um, I think that some of these, some of like what we were saying, kind of some, some of the things that, that Jill started doing have become like normalized in a certain sense. Like, um, like I think at least, um, like art forum publishes actually quite a lot of weird stuff. Like people <laughs> see them as like very kind of academic in a way, but like like Ariana Reigns has like a um, um, an astrology column that makes no sense. Um, I think some of the things that I've written for the diary are also really random. You know, when you're supposed <laughs> to be talking about the gallery weekend and you're just talking about asparagus. Um, so I think, but 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 I think the review format is really like tight and the and and the production especially if you're writing for print is really like like kind of um stifling um the production schedule um it's not like people want to write like that and even the editors want people to write like that but the art but it's this it's this thing that jill also said it's just like the art market is just i don't know criticism is mobilized in relationship to the art market in a really particular way and that um yeah. I would say it's happening outside of these forms these days. I would say, you know, I mean, it started with blogs or social mm. media, YouTube, whatever um, you can think of, but not necessarily. Yeah, but then I think that some of the stuff, because we were, we were kind of talking about that was yesterday, like that some of the forms of like radical art criticism, like today that's something like, um, like the white pube or something, if people know about that. And that's a very different kind of, that's a very different kind of approach. That's like really, like instrumentalizing our criticism for like a for a political purpose um, in a really particular way um, that I think is quite different from um, that that's not really about writing or um, it's definitely not about uncertainty it's really um, yeah the white pupe was, was here three weeks ago actually also for a talk mm. yeah. Very different format, yeah. Um, hmm. Peter? The white people, they're being used as an example often of how this take of subjective criticism and very immediate responses to reading art as a sort of way of being maybe a bit pop pop criticism, mm. how that also has the danger of being, well, taking things very unserious, or at least that, that like, where is the boundary between this freedom of expression and criticism, and then being just dumbing it down a bit. Mm. Um, I mean, this may be an interesting point, just because I'm thinking about the context here and uh, criticism, but, um, uh, I guess in, in the Nordic countries, there's mainly this uh, one online journal, uh, Kunstkritik, which is uh, almost like monopolizing. And um, uh, there was an incident uh, a couple of months ago when um, after Kunstkritik had, has opened uh, an office in Bergen and then for <laughs> a surprising, uh, surprisingly long time, there was actually no review written from Bergen. Mm. Uh, and everybody was wondering like what's happening with that office. and. Uh, uh, a, qu a semi-official response was um, there's no writers and uh, then in addition there's no writers who are not actually working for or in other ways connected to the institutions that we would write about. So there's still very much this, this, this kind of um, idea of criticism as something that's happening from an objective standpoint and even though that um, in Kunstkritik, they, I guess, they encourage different types of writing, but uh, it's still kind of based on an assumption that uh, there should be a, a, as little as possible of a meeting point between uh, the organizers, the institution, I don't know, the powerful disseminator of culture and those mm. who view it. 
Yeah, and no, I think yeah. Kritik is certainly very kind of like social democratic and slightly yeah. kind of old school in their way. I mean, I write for them too, and I enjoy writing yeah. for them, um, partly because they're state funded, so you can actually uh, write really negative reviews. Um, but but you but they have this journalistic style. You have to have like a catchy title, and you have to have you know you have to kind of it can't it can't get very weird. Um, but um, but but also they have this thing about not being entangled with the with whatever you're writing about. For me, this is very uh, sometimes very odd. Now to speak from from my perspective. Um, uh, because, I mean, it is, it is about a shared discussion, and uh, in an ideal world, uh, there would be something taken out of a conversation between organizers, artists, whoever is doing a show and those who review it, uh, and maybe a kind of a shared ambition, what to do with the text. And uh, so to, to me, it's always like, it's there, there are so few actually formats or platforms to produce texts about art, and then, um, I don't know. It becomes it becomes this this, this uh, imaginary place where you are kind of judged or valued, and um, but not really by the discussion. Mm. And that's maybe like also something that's so different to maybe um, that kind of involved criticism. That uh, it's on the opposite. It's much more about uh, knowing each other and uh, uh, knowing maybe even too much about each other and um, writing about that, making that productive and developing idea about it yeah I just want to jump in I just was thinking when we were talking about criticism and art criticism and stuff like this that a lot for me also of reading the Jill Johnston columns uh, she does so much talking as well about uh, the women's movement and uh, like I don't know all this stuff going on in there that we don't get these days I mean even like as a not a history of the time, but it's uh, a lot of conflict within it, you know, feminists against lesbians and uh, lesbians against homosexuals and like nuances and conflicts and all of this stuff, criticism against women, against motherhood, against certain things, that even that type of language, I mean, we're talking about criticism and art criticism, how there's not much room for that, but it was really uh, an experience to read it as well as, uh, and as far as gender politics or even talking about uh, like a womenhood or whatever. So that's this whole other layer that's also related, I think, in many ways to what you guys are talking about. But I just want to bring that up because it was like a super exciting experience uh, of what's going on in there as well, like beyond dance and whatever. But probably those discussions, I guess, are happening online, on social media and stuff. And maybe even, I don't know, I guess like there, there's like a nicer way of read, um, um, I don't know, because I'm wondering about this aspect of Jill Johnston, actually her politics, like when she, like something like lesbian nation, the feminist solution, it sounds like, you, it sounds like you know what that book is going to be about, or like that it's like a real argument for a fem for a lesbian nation. But it's really it's really kind of not. It's more like like lighting a turd on fire in front of someone's door and then running away. Like or like it has this more kind of she's she's kind of being provocative, and everything is about starting a fire and then kind of seeing what happens. Um, whereas like I think maybe the discourse today is kind of bogged down a lot by by like a certain like seriousness and a certain amount of paranoia that everyone is very afraid of like say, like, like putting something into words and especially into print um, that they have a problem with this or that, you know? I think that's one more reason why we definitely should read her again. <laughs> that book too, yeah. Mm, yeah. Proceed to a five-minute break and then watch a film. Thank you, everybody. Thanks.